Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm, I'm continuing my discussions on global sea level rise. Um, a paper has come out recently which has talked about global sea level rise it has began accelerating 30 years earlier than previously thought. So instead of accelerating um, at the beginning sort of of the satellite era of radi radar altimeters, so early 90s, um, it actually started accelerating in the 60s. So I'll show you the um, results of, of this paper. So this is the article um, that I ended up talking about in the last video. So um, basically the sea level rise um, over the 20th century was about 20 centimeters or 8 inches, mostly due to melting ice and ocean warming, which causes a thermal expansion of water. Um, of course, increasing sea levels are particularly dangerous for small islands in the southern hemisphere, where residents have limited ability to migrate. So, to study sea level rise, scientists have historically used tide gauges. Okay, reliance on tide gauges can be problematic. Um, there are maybe only about 70 or 80 tide gauges from before the 1950s that are still measuring sea level. Most of these are located in the northern hemisphere. Most are on continental coastlines. And there's only a, only a very limited number on islands in the open ocean. So we're only measuring along the boundaries. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the rise in sea level has a lot of different variation across the planet. And there's something called sea surface height, which is sort of the height of the ocean surface. And that varies uh, by lots of different factors. Um, for ex example, the large masses of ice on Greenland and Antarctica pull water towards it so cause the water to be bunched up along those coastlines. So that's just a gravitational attraction. Um, ocean currents, of course, temperature, you know, warmer areas of warmer ocean, the, the sea level will be higher because of the expansion of the water and so on. I mean, the water takes time to move. It doesn't move instantly. So there's a lot of dynamic variation at play. So getting back to the tide gauges, that's been the traditional way of measuring sea level rise. And to get in, to, to convert to sea level rise, we also need to know if the land is, is rising or falling, the, the isostatic um, adjustment of the land. Because um, the land itself can move up and down depending on the weight that was on the land in the past. For example, ice on the, the uh, Greenland pushes down the bedrock. Um, and because the density of ice is nominally about 0.9 grams per mil, and the density of granite um, bedrock is about 2.7 grams per mil, you know, three kilometers of ice will push the land down beneath it about a kilometer. Um, and that will reach an equilibrium. And then, of course, if the ice is forming, the land's pushed down more. And if the ice is melting, then the land will, will rise up. That's known as isostatic rebound. So you need to correct for that. Um, now, in 1993, satellite altimetry was introduced to measure sea levels around the globe. So these, basically, it's an altimeter. It sends a high-frequency pulse to the Earth, and the pulse returns back up to the satellite. And if you know how the height of the satellite, um, well, basically, the time, um, the travel time of the pulse going down to the Earth and back up, you know, the speed of the pulse, you can get the distance, and from the distance you can get an accurate um, value for, for the uh, sea level. Uh, you can calculate the sea level. So we've had an, un, an accurate, uninterrupted record of sea level change from 1993 onward, and then we, before then we need to use the tide gauges. So to get the global mean sea level before the satellites, there's two techniques that are used. We use probabilistic techniques, and there's something called the empirical orthogonal approach. Okay, the probabilistic technique can get the trends, but misses the short-term variations, and the empirical orthogonal approach can get the short-term variations, but over a shorter uh, time frame, not over the whole, the whole time frame of the, of the data. Okay, so um, basically using both of these techniques in combination 
we can get a reconstruction of both long-term changes and the short-term variability. Using one method only, you can only get one or the other, um, but using both combined, you can get a good record giving both, uh, you know, using the best of both worlds. So, you know, long-term, short-term variability, for example, is from things like El Nino, Southern Oscillation, and so. Okay, so you combine these two techniques um, to get a hybrid reconstruction, and basically, then you can calculate the increase in average sea level, global average sea level rise every year from 1900 to the present day. And basically, the data shows that global sea level rise began to accelerate persistently in the 1960s. Okay, um, it didn't start in the 1990s; it started in the 1960s. So this is a this is the annual increase in global mean sea level. So this is a like a this is a, a so this is um, a uh, sea level rise, global sea level rise of millimeters per year. You can see what it was back in 1900, just 1.39 millimeters per year. You know, there were some dips, there were some increases, you know, up to about two, you know, dips here. And you can see a steady rise here since 1960. Okay, uh, a steady rise, and we're up where we are right now, 3.44 in 2016, 3.44 millimeters per year, rising global average uh, global mean sea level rise. Okay, now if you take the derivative or the slope of this curve, which is the slope of velocity, okay, is acceleration. So this is the acceleration in millimeters per year squared. And you can see, you know, large acceleration here, you know, a, a, you know this is a zero point. So it doesn't mean when the acceleration goes up, drops, it doesn't mean that the sea level is dropping. It means that the rise, the rate of rise of the velocity of sea level is, is, de is, is, de is decreasing. So there's fluctuation, but we've reached since about 19, well, this is 1960, this is 1969. Um, since about 1969, we've had, you know, fairly high acceleration and it's starting to rise up here again. 0.07 to 0.08 sort of thing. Um, millimeters per year squared is the acceleration of global sea level rise. Okay, so basically, now what is this attributed to? Well, one of the things this study found is it looked at the spatial variation on, you know, over the planet of where of of sea level rise and the acceleration and it found finds that most of the increase in sea level rise you know in terms of where it's happening globally is thermal expansion in the Indo-Pacific and South Atlantic oceans um, you know near the regions of high intensity westerly winds so these westerly winds they blow from the west to the east in two bands, typically across the mid latitudes, one in the northern hemisphere, one in the southern hemisphere. So we're talking about the jet streams, and it moves the warmer ocean away from the surface to a different location. There's upwelling of colder ocean water, and the colder ocean water absorbs more heat, according to this, and so it expands more, raising sea levels. Okay, so indirect wind effect, they found that the increase, um, the, there was a significant increase in sea levels in the southern hemisphere, westerly wind intensification of 15% in the southern hemisphere, resulted in a 40 millimeter increase in average global sea level over 70 years. So, you know, there's a lot of contribution from ice, of course, but, you know, wind is another effect that people really haven't, I mean, we know that wind causes local variation of sea level, but you know, wind blowing, I mean, wind blowing warm surface water out of the way, causing upwelling, causing more absorption. That, that's a new um, mechanism that people haven't really considered. So, you know, why is colder water upwelling from below absorbing more solar energy? Um, and, you know, one of the things I can think of is that there's a lot of nutrients in the colder water from below. So when that water upwells, there's a lot of phytoplankton growth, and the phytoplankton darkens the ocean. 
um, you know, light that penetrates through is absorbed in the phytoplankton and, you know, that causes localized heating. And I was up at a lake um, in northern Ontario, um, you know, recently and, uh, you know, was swimming and the water was quite warm. But when I swam into weed beds, you know, the water was extremely warm at the surface. It was obviously the water amongst all of the weeds and vegetation was much, much warmer than the water around. One of the things is the weed beds would, would reduce the mixing of the water, so it could just sit there at the surface and be warmed up more. Um, you know, but also there's, uh, you know, if the surface is darkened, um, then the, uh, that will, that will, the, the absorption of solar energy will increase and that will warm the water as well. So, okay, so that's that article. And, uh, you know, this is the, so this is the um, paper itself. And before I talk about the paper, I'll talk about this um, other article here, which has a nice diagram and it shows Australia, the Southern Hemisphere. It shows you the westerly winds and it shows the acceleration in millimeters per, per uh, year squared. And the acceleration is highest is that, so 0 0.08, right, is the global average right about here, you know, there's regions, uh, there's three times higher acceleration of sea level rise in this area, just to the east of Australia, these red areas here, and there's slowed acceleration um, over here. So what's happening, happening is the westerly winds are blowing here, the Coriolis deflects things to the left in the southern hemisphere, so it's pushing the water, Ekman flow is pushing the water from this region here over to this region here. So the sea level is, the water is being piled up here consistently. So sea level is, is rising much, much faster here and much, much slower here. I think that's just basically what's happening. But generally that would just be, you know, thought of as a regional effect, but they're, they're saying that, that it's, um, that uh, basically, well, it's the largest component of that 0 0.08 global rise um, in sea level. Okay, so that's the key, uh, key plot. Um, so, you know, they talk about the changing winds affect sea level in two ways. First, they move warm upper ocean water masses northward, causing a large increase in the rates of sea level rise in the subtropical Pacific, but it also controls the uptake of heat by the ocean below. So upwelled cold water takes up heat more quickly than the replaced upper ocean warm water. So when the, so that when the winds intensify 15%, there's more heat pumped in from the atmosphere into the ocean, leading to an expansion of the water column and therefore a rise in global sea level. Okay, so that's the key finding of, of this paper. So looking at the paper here, um, so basically let's look at the, um, the data here. So these are different tide gauges here. This is the uh, satellite data, the altimetry data here, and what you can see is you can see sea level, this is in millimeters, so this is the trend, you know, from 1900 to present day in the southern ocean. The, the red is the, you know, from 1993 onward, the altimeters, and the blue is the tide gauge data, and you can see how each of the different regions of the ocean is um, warming. You, know, you can see a large spike up here in the eastern Pacific um, and so on. So you can see the, the trends in all of the different basins. Um, this is the data. Um, there's a table here which is basically showing this data but in, in, a, in a table form rather than in graphs. And you can see, um, so this is the key data here. This is the um, basically 1900 to present day, and you can see the, so this is the, the rise in global mean sea level in millimeters, and you can see, look at it here from about 1960 or so, uh, you can see the curve is rapidly getting steeper and steeper. So this is an accelerating curve. Um, this is the velocity um, of sea level rise, the derivative of this curve, and then this is the acceleration. So I've always I'll, I'll already shown you these these plots here, these two plots here, and you can see you know 0 0.08 or so is the typical average here, and the acceleration's been you know there is fluctuation from year to year, but basically the trends are upward. Thank you for listening.